Um, just wanted to thank very much. Uh, thank you all for coming. All the external guests. Can, can you raise your hand? How many people from not eBay advertising? Okay. Uh, I hear the traffic has been really bad from um, 101 South, um, so it, it's a little bit of a difficult uh, to come up here. Anyway, uh, uh, several people responded, but anyway, um, we'll, we'll, we'll just get started. I wanted to start with just a brief introduction of eBay advertising, five minutes. I'll, I'll tell you who we are and what we're doing tonight, um, and then I'll hand it off to Prakash and um, Srini for uh, the talk, the main, main event today. So eBay advertising, we are uh, obviously part of eBay. Uh, we are focused on building, on building advertising technology. And uh, we have a lot of data. We use that data to power advertising both on eBay and off eBay on hundreds of millions of sites. Um, as you can imagine, we've got a lot of powerful data and there's a lot of scope for doing very cool science. Uh, and optimization work here, and that's what we all, we're all excited about. We do advertising uh, in all kinds of formats, um, from um, uh, simple branding type advertising up at the conversion funnel to uh, performance advertising down at the bottom of the funnel, uh, mid funnel. We do advertising in different kinds of media, different formats. We do uh, product listings ads for performance, and we do um, uh, even mobile recently. So uh, we, we are uh, building a lot of um, new technology, especially in the display advertising area, and um, we just wanted to uh, start off this series with um, telling you a little bit about that, and, and then how we are utilizing Aerospike uh, technology underneath. Uh, uh, just a little bit about this location. Uh, you might be wondering, eBay is um, located in South Bay, San Jose, and uh, we are here in Brisbane. So this is really a old acquisition, shopping.com, as you might know. Um, so eBay advertising is primarily located here in Brisbane office. Um, and um, this floor, and we are now expanding on the third floor down there. Uh, as for me, I, I run the technology organization here, joined about a year ago, and um, I've, I've built advertising technology uh, a couple of times before, so you know, usually it's not very interesting to do something, same thing for the third time. But when I really started to consider it today, um, and, and how much data we have access to here, that really sparked that um, interest in me, and I absolutely leaped on it, jumped on it, and joined. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a flavor for what kind of data we have access to, uh, eBay uh, last year, I believe, was uh, it did something like 175 billion dollars worth of uh, commerce on the web. That's huge. Um, we are one of the two largest companies in the uh, commerce business and have this kind of a purchase intent data. Um, another angle to look at it uh, from data perspective, we have. Um, about 1.5, 1.8 billion searches every month. That makes us really third or fourth largest search engine in the world, uh, behind Google and Microsoft. So consider that. Um, but we are different. Um, you go to Google, you do different kind of searches. But when you come to eBay, you really want to buy something. So, so the quality of data we've got access to is, is really impressive. Um, so, so that really sparked my, uh, my interest, and I decided to really come here and join. And I hope you will really like what we are building here, and Prakash will talk more about it. But um, in terms of logistics, I uh, just wanted to uh, let you know, uh, this is the first in the series of talks. We just decided to, to uh, start conversation and engage with the folks in the industry, we um, believe through this dialogue, we can build better products and better technology. Uh, we will be doing more of this uh, in future, but this is our first one, so, so we have a little bit of a, a learning curve here uh, in organizing these kind of events. Um, 
I don't want to take too much of time, so I'll just get started. But before I get started, I uh, just wanted to let you know, if you have not dropped your card and did the registration, uh, please do that. And if you don't have a business card, you might want to write your name and all the details. There it is. Um, uh, because we do have some cool giveaways uh, at the end, including an iPad mini. So you might want to just do that. Um, we have uh, uh, Gautam Talker. I just wanted to ask him if you wanted to say anything uh, before before we launched into the... Um... No, I just, I mean, I won't take up much time. I think you guys are here for some technical conversation, maybe a little bit of food and drink. But uh, so let's just get started. I'm excited to see the first tech talk that we're doing get, get going. Uh, and certainly, as Satish said, you know, the advertising space is relatively new for eBay. But I think when we spoke 15 months ago, Satish was, I'll say this anyway, about to go and start his own company. So it's not often that people who are about to go start their own company come and work uh, in a company like eBay. But I think the potential that he saw around the data and what we can build is certainly the same thing we feel excited about. So we won't talk too much about eBay today, but that's what we are here for. I want to get the best brains in the ad tech space together as much as we can and spark conversation on how we can all grow this industry. So thank you again for coming. and. Uh, Look forward to questions, answers, and engaging conversation. Right. So Prakash will first talk about uh, what we're doing at eBay Advertising, and then uh, Srini, who is the co-founder of Aerospike. And Aerospike, by the way, has been a great partner, and they have really helped us with this uh, organizing this event. So thank you very much, uh, Monica. There. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, so thank you very much for that. Uh, but uh, we'll talk about Aerospike technology that we are using underneath our main core system data management platform. So, uh, uh, and, and maybe we can hold off on the question to the very end because uh, we are starting the event a little bit late. So, so let's get, get started. Prakash. Hi everyone. Uh, so my name is Prakash. Uh, I head the engineering for the display advertising group here. I, I want this to be a little bit of a conversation. So I take maybe like uh, 30 seconds to take one or two questions from you guys to start with. What did you guys come here to hear today? And hopefully one of us will cover most of those things. But if not, then at least I want to start with that. Just one or two questions from me, from people. What do you guys want to hear today? Or something that you want to get out of the talk before the end of the day today? Come on, anyone. So some uh, new technology challenge in terms of speed? Like, you know. Absolutely. So I will cover that since uh, Aerospike was a new technology for us, and what our learnings were, and then I talk about that as well. So let's get started. Uh, uh, Satish already covered most of what I wanted to talk about in the introduction, who we are and what we do. At the core of our technology platform here is an eBay audience platform, and that powers a various set of customers that we have, uh, one of being an advertising on eBay. Uh, when we are using, and I talk in more detail about eBay audience platform, what we do there, but, but all of advertising on eBay is powered by our eBay audience platform, which is like when people want to show ads on eBay. And, and just to give you a sense of scale of how many ads we show on eBay, it's about 500 million ads per day. And that should tell you how big, just as a, as a publisher, how big we are. And advertising off eBay, the same data that we use to power advertising on eBay, we're utilizing it to power advertising <laughs> off eBay. And they're working with partners, uh, publishers, buying it off the exchanges, or working with our advertising partners uh, to actually power their advertisement and bidding audiences for them. And all of this also use eBay as an advertiser. When people come to eBay, they're looking for a certain item, they go back, they don't really make the purchase at the time, uh, we can say, yes, let's bring those people back to eBay as an advertiser and show them the similar ads. Just to give a sense of, I mean, why we think we can be successful, you already heard Satish and Gautam talk about it. We have two advantages that we think we can make here, the difference here. One is by data, and second is by building the right technology. Okay. Give you a sense of the data. eBay, across all of the properties, eBay marketplaces, uh, PayPal, StubHub, GSI Commerce, if I go back all the way where these sites have started, we have approximately two petabytes of data. And that's huge because we can not only say about what people are buying today, we can go back in history and look at what these people have been buying year after year for the products that they are buying yearly. And for the products which have a longer life cycle, we can look back and say, these are the people who bought phone two years ago in this month, because people almost buy phones two years in a cycle. For automotive, this may be a longer cycle. 
Yeah, there are very, very few companies who can actually say that we can predict cycles of when people are going to look for the next car. And we are one of those companies that we can do that. I don't think there's anybody else who can talk about outside some of these things. So automotive, when, when they, these are working on a cycles. For a yearly cycle, you can think of people who are buying jewelry in a certain month. I mean, we have 100 million users on eBay. And when I say 100 million active users on eBay, we are defining it not as somebody who just came and visited eBay. We're talking about people who have done engagement events on eBay more than a certain number of times a month. And that is 100 million just in the US alone. So if you look at it, they're just buying something for their families or birthdays or things happening. Then, yes, give it or take, there are 10 million people who are buying birthday gifts on eBay every month. But which are those 10 million people? We can predict that. We can stay ahead of the market before they start actually surfing online, say, I'm looking for a gift for my wife. We can actually predict a lot of these cases. Looking at the data point of view, I mean, we have like not only just eBay, but first and third party data that we collect. When we work with advertisers, uh, we are placing a pixel on their site. And that is helping us learn about their customers, what their customers are doing on their sites. And that data itself is huge because you work with hundreds of advertisers, you're getting all of that signal, and you have to come and make sense out of these things. Looking at number of events per day on eBay itself, that's more than 200 billion per day. And this is not even including some of the sister properties that we have. So from the data point of view, I want to get a sense out of how big are we talking about. And when we're talking in buying on exchanges, there are 30 billion plus ad requests per day happening. And we want to serve all of those things. We want to at least, when those requests come, within milliseconds, we want to identify that person understand what they would have done in the last 10 years. So of course, give and take, how we do that. And that's the technology piece I talk about. And then we say, yes, what is the best ad to show to them at this time? To build a system at that scale and to be able to serve or listen to about 30 billion, that's huge, right? That amounts to something like 300,000 per second, or a number more than that. So let's jump deeper into the technology. And this is the class diagram for the technology. Yeah, this is exactly, I'm just kidding. So, <laughs> I, I wanted to show conceptually what we are doing first, right? We are aggregating all of the user behavior, what people are doing on eBay, off eBay, and when we bring all of the data back, somebody has a cookie, we find out that, yes, this person is surfing on Firefox. Now they went onto their mobile phone and they started looking for another product. And then they went to their iPad and then they bought the thing. In order to be able to claim that conversion, we want to say, yes, we can identify the people from one, to second to third. And then we get a complete picture. And for that, we have developed a technology <coughs> called ID mapping. And I dig deeper into this in the next slide. Not only we just want to understand what people are serving at different places or different devices, we want to understand what ads we showed to them when and what leads to the best conversion. Is showing an ad, which is a big display ad in the morning, and then showing a conversion kind of ad in the evening helps, or it's the other way around. When do people make purchases? Or after how many ads do they make purchases? Okay? And maybe that's different for different type of people. But once you're, in order for to do any of these analysis, it's important that we recognize uniquely that this is the person. And we are showing ads on them on mobile, off mobile, and when they are clicking on mobile, lots of people don't click on mobile. They won't make a purchase on mobile, but that has an influence on their buying decision. And that's the important part. You're driving home, you will see an ad, you are not know why it's there, but maybe it's in the back of your head. And that's what we want to be able to connect and predict. <coughs> and that's where some of these technologies come in. So we bring all of this data using our ID mapping. Now we have a unified view of a user. Every time we listen to an ad request, using that unified view of a user, we are able to segment them. Is this person going to buy a camera in the next 30 days or not? And depends on what kind of campaign we are running. <coughs> And that information gets assigned, and then we bid in the exchanges. Again, the scale is what you're talking about. We're able to do it 30 billion times a day, and do it at scale, do it at speed, the high speed that we're talking about. Once we show ads, we bring the data back in, analyze the data, present reports, and of course, gain insights out of this. What did we do yesterday that worked? What did we do yesterday that did not work? And our algorithms go around and say, here are the features of people who are converting. These type of people, or people who have certain features convert on weekends versus weekdays. These are the insights that we are able to draw on a regular manner. Digging a little 
deeper onto the user identification because this is one of the technologies that we're very proud of and utilize our spike for it. Conceptually, what we're trying to do is, and I already talked about, right? We have user who is going on mobile or different devices, and that information comes in, and we have a unified view of a user. This service allows us to map them back and forth. And we are talking about 100 million active users who have approximately about 2 billion cookies, even in the last six, eight months that we have been collecting data, because people actually remove cookies a lot. They are on multiple browsers, they are on multiple devices. But as eBay, we are able to map them back because they have logged in from each of these devices at least once. When you're talking about rest of the advertising companies, they're selling cookies. And they have no idea whether the person on the Firefox is the same as Chrome, even on the same computer. Forget different computers, forget different devices. We are not only able to tie it on the same computer, but different devices. So that is one thing that we are feel very proud of because eBay is in a unique position to solve that problem. And people who are from AdTech, I mean, understand that that is the huge problem outside. You, you may buy 500 million cookies, but you really don't know if there are 10 million people under those or who are those people and how many of those cookies are extinct. As eBay, since we are able to connect to an eBay login, and not just eBay login, I mean, eBay has a graph of identity when you talk about PayPal users, StubHub users, we can bring all of that information and connect to people. So this service we have built, which is essentially goes back and forth between these two IDs. Every time you want to listen to an ad request, you want to understand who that user is, and then make decision. That's actually when we were starting to think about it. We looked at it as two indexes. Like, we get a cookie or the device that the person is actually on at this point, and then we want to get back the information, what is our unified ID for that person. And once we have segmented the person, in a manner that this is the right person for this ad, and I want to buy, buy media, then you want to do the reverse mapping, essentially. That we want to understand who is the unified ID in our system, and then find, let us say I'm working with a DSP partner or an exchange, what is this person's ID on this exchange? And the key piece being because we don't want to give our IDs away. We don't want to leak data in that sense. Uh, I mean, there's one thing about data everybody says, right? If you sell the data, you can only sell it once. But if you use the data, you can continue to sell the data again and again and again. And that is something that we want to do as eBay advertising, right? Utilize the power of eBay data and continue to sell it. So we don't want to give our IDs away. We want to say, yes, this, this is how you understand this person. We are going to give you those IDs. So back and forth mapping. And we are actually using Aerospy for this. It has been good. Uh, what happens here is that we, I, I'll give you a scenario. We should talk a little bit about reconciliation and where these things come in. That a user comes to eBay, they have not logged in. So possibly they came for the first time, we dropped a cookie, and we identified them. <coughs> on, a second com on, on the same computer, maybe the same device, a few days later they logged in. Now we are able to tie back that this person is the same person who came to us three days ago, and they searched for it. And at that point we have these two profiles that need to be merged. And that is where the reconciliation happens between these devices. We bring all of the events together and sometimes they may be two different cookies that we are merging because now we know the same login. You can extend this into so many other IDs as well. Like, they may be two eBay users, but from the PayPal point of view, they are the same person because they share a credit card. So the power of this thing is huge because you're not just talking, yes, for, for months you may continue to believe they are two unique individuals, but at some point we can tie them. And that is where we want to say, yes, now let's bring them together and see what does this help us learn about their profile. So this is where Aerospike enters. The two problems that Aerospike helps us solve is speed and scale. Right? We, are looking, we were looking for a technology, and we actually did prioritize with a lot of, of, of similar technologies that have in this space, uh, including uh, Redis, Ariac. And what we were looking for is a low latency in the sense that you want to have some millisecond to come. When we're talking about 30 billion of this day, then we are saying, yes, we may have to do this very quickly. And you have 50 milliseconds to respond to an ad, but in order to look up ID, you don't have that much time. And you want to build a profile, update your system, segment them, and have your algorithms give a chance what is the right amount of money I want to spend at this time. So there's a lot more going on than just identification. So identification needs to happen in the sub millisecond time frame. And the second, of course, is uh, 3 billion, 30 billion ad requests translates to something like 400 QPS. And that's the average number. During the peak time, this may be double than that. And that's when we benchmarked a lot of these technologies. We came up to, yes, Aerospike is actually a kick spot here. 
scalability. And this is, the people who have worked in ad technologies, there are a lot of technologies who can do clusters, <laughs> but how many of them actually scale horizontally? In order to get to 2x, how much more servers do I have to add? Am I scaling horizontally or is there exponential curve? And we have made some of the similar mistakes in past in our, the technologies that we have worked on, I have done that. And at a certain point, if you like, oh, this is great, it's horizontally scaling. And it, it comes a point where you say it doesn't work anymore. And so far, we have been actually very good with uh, and talking about scale operations ease, I mean, automatic failover. Like, yes, systems will go down. When you're talking about these big numbers, you want something that actually fails over very automatically. And if you want to add new servers, you don't want to bring down it, everything. I mean, as eBay, if you bring down everything before we have to upgrade our thing, and that's just that's not good enough for us. And the one and most important thing that we have done with so many other technologies before our time is replication across data centers. When you are serving ads with those tight SLAs that we have, you have servers across different uh, different time zones, and the same person comes to from two different things. You want to understand that I have shown ad to this person or not. We work with some advertisers who have very tight frequency cap, so the publisher may be working with us, and they may route the request through some, any other network. So one request may go to East Coast, one request may go to West Coast. So when you really are working under tight frequency capping. You want to make sure that you have not shown an ad to this person before. And therefore, you want to have this replication across data centers in real time. And so far, Aerospike actually, I want to say yes, they have been actually amazing for us. Right? I mean, you can talk about strength. Uh, we have measured this over and over again. 90 percentiles comes within like less than 2 milliseconds. Uh, it scales linearly. Rebalancing happens automatically. Uh, doesn't require as much of a hand-holding or sharding. I mean, it has a you can, you can add new nodes and it will automatically balance. You can upgrade versions. And of course, there are a couple of things about room to grow. We keep talking about them in turn, and we have talked with the uh, Aerospike team as well. When we are talking about real time user profiles, these profiles get big. And you are holding them in memory. Right? And there are some limitations on how much you can hold for per record. And I think you guys are come, Aerospike is coming up with technology that can actually make this better. Data browsing, when you're talking about the amount of data we have, it's very difficult for our engineers to sometimes figure out, just by looking at it, hey, where is my data? The third thing I want to talk about is that cookies expire a lot. So we typically try to do something like, hey, let's just put a TTN on it. But as we, as we, I showed you before, right, we have these two maps. And therefore, if it gets treated in one place, you want to automatically have it cascade to other places. Okay. But more importantly than anything else, all of these trends, one thing that we have always been impressed with our spike is the knowledge that the team has on everything that we talk about, right? And I hear this from my team every day. Like, yeah, these people know what they're talking about, and they're very helpful, and that's the kind of company that we want to work with. So, with that, thank you very much. I introduce Srini. I think we'll talk more deeper about this thing than we go to questions later on. Thank you, um, Satish and Prakash. Um, uh, that was actually um, great motivation uh, for why Aerospike is important. I'd also like to welcome uh, the Scale Warriors um, for the meetup today. Uh, and thanks to eBay for hosting us. So, um, given that um, we already have had a kind of pretty clear um, explanation of why Aerospike is needed, I'm just going to uh, quickly skip past some of the you know, parts of my presentation and go to the technical parts, which I'm sure most people are interested in. Like this slide doesn't work, but it doesn't matter because Prakash has already talked about it. So, um, just to give an idea of the sort of um, companies um, uh, and enterprises that we are talking about, which require um, the kinds of you know, which are the kinds of requirements Prakash talked about, I uh, just have you know, of course, liberally you know, lifted from errors by customers here, but they are all internet enterprises in various aspects of things. Um, so, you know, I just skip past this. I just want to spend a, like maybe a 30 seconds on the database landscape as we see it. Okay. So uh, you are familiar, of course, with the structured data on the left of this um, chart. And these are the traditional databases dealing with uh, transactions and analytics, you know, OLAP, OLTP, you know, the sort of classical database sense. Um, and then, of course, uh, a lot of uh, work has happened in big data analytics, you know, Hadoop, um, and in fact, Teradata and a whole bunch of other you know, the old companies are coming back. Uh, with competitive solutions. Now, when we started Aerospike about four years ago, uh, the, uh, the top right, which is real-time big data, 
uh, was actually being solved in a number of internet companies. But they were all being solved by proprietary solutions inside Google, Facebook, you know, Yahoo, you know, which is where I work, uh, and so on. Now, the issue there is, uh, when we started it, what, what we wanted to do was essentially build a product uh, which would enable everybody else who doesn't have the engineering know-how, um, like a Google or a Facebook has, in order you know, to also launch um, um, applications at the same scale uh, faster. Our goal was to speed up the launch of applications on the internet, okay, as we saw it. And that's, to some extent, uh, what we have, you know, we're helping uh, eBay with, but also we've helped a number of our customers with over the last four years. And this is the obligatory marketing slide, you know, the Gartner slide, and it shows Aerospark as the only visionary, and we are pretty proud of that. Um, not because we showed up in the Gartner slide, but proud of the fact that we've been visionaries and been recognized. So, um, I quickly go past that. Now, here's, here's how Aerospark is usually uh, deployed. We already have the presentation of Prakash, so I'm going to skip past this too. Because all it's saying is, um, Aerospark actually uh, sits at the edge of your application, you know. Uh, you know, towards the internet or towards the network, and every user and so on coming into your system will be, you know, hitting the front end. And then Aerospike allows uh, these applications to have access in real time to the latest data which these particular users, you know, um, have created or, you know, based on that behavior and so on. So you can give them better customer service. So that's kind of, and, and, and all of the other data is also playing in the system, like the data warehouse from Hadoop, in the relation database you know, data, and of course, you know, you're on the left you have the consumers. So what is it that we are trying to solve here, okay, to get, you know, get right down to it? What Aerospec is trying to solve, um, the kinds of problems we're trying to solve for applications, uh, which are 24 by 7, you know, uh, need high throughput and low latency, they kind of go in twofold. Okay? One is on the application side, another one is on the operational side. The first three points on this slide are to deal with uh, the applications. How can we actually build applications which have high rates of read-write transactions over persistent data? This has been traditionally a very hard problem. Okay, typically, you know, if you look at the old, um, um, you know, TPC C benchmarks, you know, 60s, you know, whatever, 70s, 80s, or whatever it is, uh, thousand transactions per second was like huge. Okay, when they hit thousand, it was like a huge party. You know? uh, we are like talking about millions of transactions per second today. You know, that's kind of what we're trying to do to, to enable these applications. Now, avoid hotspots. Okay, well, why do we need to avoid hotspots? Hotspots are the killer. They essentially uh, essentially kill the service immediately. If there is a hotspot, and the analogy I usually give is one of driving your car, you know, as I used to do as a graduate student across cross country. Okay. Um, for me, uh, if there's one little thing which is wrong in the car, it will break down somewhere along the way. Okay. And for me, it always used to be over Utah near Salt Lake City. But I don't know why that was. But the point is that it happens, OK? So and then providing immediate consistency with the application. This is the other point. Applications need to be, this is a fundamental database concept from ever since databases were thought of. Applications need to be easy to write. And you do not want the application writer to figure out consistency, OK, and replicate how many copies you have to keep. You know, a system, you know, person designing should set it up, and the application writer should write applications, and then launch it. And then you should be able to change it based on whatever other requirement system has. And the last three points, the bottom three, you know, are all about operations. If you can do high throughput and low latency, and it runs for five minutes, it's useless. It needs to run day in and day out for the internet. And this, to some extent, this actually, all of these requirements come from the internet area, okay? The enterprise uh, systems were quite fine for business systems, so to speak, for the last 25, 30 years. The internet, on the other hand, showed up, and then uh, there was no stopping it which means that the databases just couldn't keep up with it, right? And so you need to make sure that long-running tasks, this is always a, it's also a classical database problem, when you have data which is rebalanced. This is a humongous data job, you know, which has to kind of, you know, shipping terabytes of data across your cluster, and you have transactions going at like, you know, 100,000 transactions per second with sub millisecond latency, you know, you gotta kind of solve that problem. And also scale linearly, and this is another problem, right? And again, it goes a little bit related to the avoiding hotspots thing, but linear scaling, you know, as Prakash pointed out, um, is not easy. Okay, you need to actually think through and simplify your architectures at a level. And again, the internet major companies, you know, including uh, eBay, I mean, you got to figure it out by yourself uh, over and over again. And this, what Aerospike tries to do is to kind of build all this knowledge inside. 
Um, and adding capacity with no service interruption. Capacity changes all the time. You launch something and you find it's much more popular than it is. You don't want to be caught in a business situation where you cannot scale your business. You know, uh, and that is actually worse than you know actually not launching at all. You know, launching and failing is worse because then everybody knows how bad things are, right? I mean, or you, you can just simply wait and launch later, which is also not an option given the competitive nature of this. So what kind of system architecture is needed for 100% uptime? I kind of couched it in terms of 100% uptime because it's a given that you need to have high throughput and low latency, otherwise we wouldn't be talking today. So while you know, doing that problem with 100% uptime is really hard. So some of the kind of principles we have used in Aerospike to make our system um, kind of achieve that goal of 100% uptime as of the service. You know, as Prakash pointed out, nodes will fail, networks will fail, all of that stuff will happen. What you do need to have is two kinds of solutions. One is you need something which is kind of localized. We call that within a cluster. Our clusters are tightly coupled. They are shared nothing clusters with every node being identical to every other node. This actually gives some of the characteristics that Prakash again pointed out in the talk, where you can just add a node, it just comes online. Okay? Um, and that is important because uh, it, it just simplifies the whole architecture and makes things work. Uh, or at least it's easy to figure out when things don't work, so you can actually fix the bugs easily. And the point is, um, and the data has to be, you know, and that's kind of the other trade-off we made. Now, there is always a trade-off of when you have multiple nodes in a cluster, you need to discover what is a cluster. You can't actually, you know, if you do it one of two ways, and Aerospike did it, uh, I think, um, by making it completely distributed in, the, in, you know, in terms of how the cluster constitutes itself. So each of these nodes are identical, they come together, and then they are placed close to each other, and that's critical. You have to make certain choices and trade-offs in terms of how you distribute data and how you replicate data within particular geographical areas, and then you also need to have enough to have asynchronous distribution across data centers. Okay. So both of that, I think, are important. So the kind of way in which Aerospike um, solved this problem was essentially by synchronously replicating within a cluster and asynchronously replicating across the cluster. You know, to some extent, if some of you may be interested in looking up some of the Google papers on this topic of Spanner and so on, where they try to do transactions across data centers. And, and there are ways to solve it, if you're Google, and you can put GPS on every machine, um, you can actually solve it to a pretty, you know, sophisticated level. Now, you could, on the other hand, also solve it uh, differently, you know, like what we do. So there are, those choices are actually important. Um, and, and I think... Um, I mean, we published a bunch of this stuff uh, about a couple of years ago uh, at VLDB. So this is kind of serious technology <coughs> in some way. A little bit more about eliminating hotspots. Okay. Um, everybody here probably knows about a distributed hash table. Does everybody know what a DHT is? Or there are people who don't know what it is? Okay. So all a distributed hash table is, uh, essentially you take a key uh, and you can hash it to some digest and distribute it across. So what it means is when you are accessing a query uh, on, a, on an item, you can use the hash key to go to a particular location. If you can just distribute it that way, it's, it, it becomes a, you know, I talked about a shared nothing cluster. <coughs> so distributed hash by nature enables something to share nothing because you just take the key and then go to the place where it is and it is localized there. So you don't have to go and deal with the other node which has other keys in it. It's a divide and conquer algorithm and it works very well. Now, what have we done in terms of our algorithms is actually also very simple to describe. So we take the, the keys is split into, uh, you know, the key space, if you will, is split into uh, 4K partitions. Okay. So what you do is you take the key, and then you hash it using a very robust hash function. It's important to have a robust hash function. We use a RIPE MD160, um, which, you know, which is actually has excellent collision characteristics, for example. So um, there are papers written on this, okay? You can, you can go refer. So what you end up doing is you take the, you know, we, we use a 20 byte uh, hash digest, okay? And, and that determines the partition the key is in. So you got the key, and it just, you don't even need to be on the server or anything. You can just write code, uh, which is kind of publicly available to compute this digest, you know? And then you have partition. Now, what is the interesting part here is, now we have nodes in the cluster, and that changes, right? The partitions are mapped to nodes. Now, this is a you know, 4K by uh, you know, node size you know, uh, level matrix, right? So the idea is, you know, what, I, what I've shown here is essentially a list of partitions, and then what is the master node and the replica node for each of those? Now, it is important that all the nodes are unique across this, and 
uh, all on each of the nodes is actually represented in an equal part, you know kind of proportion down down the column. Okay, that, that's kind of the that's how the whole partition works. It, it is you know our, our mapping is completely random. There are some interesting characteristics characteristics of the random mapping uh, because as you uh, and, and I just I, I just you know I'm just going to um, um, declare the result. You, you know I, I leave the proof to the to the I guess the people here. I, I can do it offline. But the point is, as you as your cluster size increases, okay, if the cutting down one node out of the cluster, or maybe let's say two nodes, if you're having replica factor two, you know, so if you take down two nodes, some of the data in the cluster will become unavailable. This whole this, if you have two copies, then if you take down two nodes, then you know that there are some partitions which will be uh, only in those two nodes. As the size of the cluster increases, the uh, the function is that you don't actually lose. Uh, data proportional to the node going down. So it won't be like one tenth of the data is unavailable in a ten node cluster when you take down two nodes. It will be more like, you know, one fiftieth, point one, you know, some really small percentage of it. And it's really the, the birthday paradox in action okay, because of the random way in which you know, both, both the master and the replica has to be in those two nodes. And you can do the calculation separately. And that's important. And that reduces hot spots. Okay? So all of this kind of distribution of uh, making, and, and it is kind of Okay, what is hard here? It is what is hard here is actually the following point. Okay, before I go there, so you have two columns I've shown here, but two copies. The, the algorithm is gentle enough; you can have more columns. If you want three copies, there's one more column in this table, and the algorithm just works. Okay, we've tested up to like I don't know in a ten node cluster, we did like seven copies or something, and it works fine. And and the interesting thing is, um, you know, uh, it's simplicity again, right? Helps uh, to debug it. Now here is what the hard problem is. What is the problem? The, the problem is when you add nodes to the cluster, the map changes. Because there are new nodes. If you have three node cluster, as we shown here on the right, you add a new node, the first thing that happens is the map changes. Where, which partitions are where is basically the new map. And that has to change. And, and, and what we do is we figure out within maybe a couple hundred milliseconds what the original map is, which, which we the cluster knows. A new node comes in, it joins the cluster. At that point, the new cluster immediately agrees within that short amount of time what the new map is going to be. They're all in sync, except the data is not anywhere close to where the map is going to be. And that's kind of the entire kind of IP that we have, is to figure out how do you send, you know, once the cluster discovers the new node, it, it, it determines a new data organization, and then it schedules a set of what we call our migrations. This is nothing but data rebalancing of each partition. Again, it's a divide and control algorithm. You have 4K partitions, you know, and then there are like N nodes. And as you increase nodes, right, each node reserves a capacity, a portion of its uh, capacity to do migrations. So as you add more nodes in the cluster, there is more capacity to migrate, period. So it scales, okay? You know, there is no hotspot again. You know, you can have more data, you have more capacity. Fine. It is basically proportional to the data you're migrating and the, and the cluster that you have, and that's, a, that, that's the best you can do, actually. You know? And then what we do is, the other problem comes. So you have a node, and then it's not going to migrate this huge partition across. The, la the first thing you don't want to do is to take the entire resources of this node and start dumping everything that you got to migrate on the network, because you will bring down the network. You just can just do the map. So what you have to do is to make sure each of these nodes understands what the capacity, you know, what the, the requirements are in terms of real-time transactions coming in and things going out, so you can real-time adjust the priority on a node-by-node -node basis, which we have flow control, for example, implemented for migrations, because think of this following problem. Let's say you have a 50-node cluster, okay? You add a new node. Now, this node has no data. 49 nodes are going to just dump data on it, all the incoming migrations, right? I mean, you can just bring that up. You know, every time you add a new node, it'll just go down, right? I mean, it's possible, you know? But so what we can do in that case is limit. In this node, you know, I won't take more than three or four migrations, and then everybody else will wait. It'll slow down, but it's okay. It'll work. So those are the kind of decisions we, we ended up making in these algorithms. Okay? Uh, and then we, of course, have to do the partition move atomically. You know, we have a journal which we keep for a short time to make sure we don't lose rights. And here's another principle that we use. So when you have two partitions which are active, um, then we would have to actually expend some extra resources to send rights to both, so you don't lose data. So, you know, Aerospike is one of the few new kinds of databases which deals with ACID, which means we cannot offer, we can't, we, we can't, there can't be a hole where you lose data. So you're going to have to close every hole, which means closing the hole can be done the old way. Okay, this is important. The old way, which is like the, the way I used to be, you know, 
uh, you know, PhD on, which is you put something in persistent storage, um, you make sure it's there, you do a write ahead log, okay, that's one way to close it. That's too slow, it's not, it doesn't work. So the other way to do it is, since you have a lot of machines, you know, we have Moosla has helped us over the last 20 years to build these machines, and SSDs are growing, what you do is, you use more resources. So you just send writes to both nodes, okay? And then you close the hole because now you're wasting the last uh, whatever two seconds when the partition is doing, you're just spending, sending all these writes to both nodes, but you have capacity anyway, because with the super performance that Aerospec has, you just bought yourself all this capacity to do this, do this extra work to save your time. So, you know, it's, it's basically a trade-off one makes to keep performance. Once you say the performance is going to be there, the drivers of performance is the next thing I will talk about. There's something about, um, the one other thing I want to point out before I go there, writing with immediate consistency. This has always, you know, uh, been kind of a major goal for us. So we would always write to two copies. There are two copies. Uh, the master will coordinate a transaction to write to the replica before, and then the return value has to come to the master before the client gets the return, you know, code or whatever. So it knows whether both copies are written. And we do not write, synchronously write to disk. Okay? It, again, it's important because one way to get persistence and what you call robustness of, of this is to write to disk. Okay? But then if you look at it, if you write to two copies, or three copies. At some point, you go like, you know, you can actually do the, you know, I think Mike Stonebreaker has this whole thing about case safety algorithm. So if you actually, if you want to really want to be safe, write ten copies. But but that is not going to be any better or worse than writing to disk. Okay, it's just going to be slow writing to disk. <laughs> That's what you're going to get. So what we are trying to do is we make it go fast with as much reliability as you would get for writing to disk. So that so we we don't want to give that up. And that's kind of the immediate consistency part has costs associated with it in terms of writing both copies. And the costs can be paid because the networks are faster, the, um, you know, uh, essentially the, the whole machine is faster, so we can actually do it. And then Aerospike makes sure that we don't slow anything down by having record locking and so on. There's a whole bunch of little design decisions which go in to run that fast. It's like a race car. I mean, you've got to really tune it. And we actually spent a lot of time making sure our requirements were as stringent as possible and then made sure from day one thought through what it is that will slow down and remove it, okay? And then we also wanted to keep consistency. That's why it makes it hard. If you don't want to keep consistency, this is actually not very hard. And this is the other part, okay? Linear scalability. It's actually a, a simple thing to scale linearly if you make your client intelligent. It, what cannot be afforded, right, in, in a system like this is a level of indirection when you send a request to the server. It is a simple way to bring down the cluster. Because now every request goes to a server, which now has to go inside the cluster. That's like an extra loop. Doesn't work. What you need to do is to make your clients intelligent. We spent a bunch of time figuring out how to share that partition map I talked about, which the cluster knows about. We actually make sure that the partition map is also available on the client. Not in the same form the, the server uses it, but enough information for the client to route intelligently within the cluster. So in steady state, Aerospike is guaranteed to scale linearly by definition because every re you know, key request coming into a client, you have the map, it goes to the exact server. It's almost like each client has its own server. It's not a cluster. But when, and then at the time when you actually have to pay the price is when you add a new node, a node you know, is removed and some migrations are going on. At that point, uh, it will slow down, but the way we reduce the slowdown is very simple. We have excess capacity in the system, so the, and we prioritize the thing in real time. So, you know, you can slow down, even in, in a very heavily, uh, in, a, in a system which is very running very close to high capacity, we have ability to slow down migrations to whatever level you want to allow runtime transactions. So you always have a way to get your work done. It's just a trade-off, you know, time space, you know, long transaction, short transaction trade-off. It's all trade-offs. And then you can choose it. And typically for uh, internet scale applications, you don't want to keep a system running more than 40% or 30% capacity. You don't know when that spike's going to come because Michael Jackson basically died or something. You know, it actually brought down like most of the uh, you know sites on the internet, except Yahoo didn't go down. So you know, we knew this kind of stuff happened. You know, so I was at Yahoo then. So. <laughs> <laughs> Still proud of that stuff. So anyway, so, so that that kind of gives you the idea of. This is the performance stuff, okay? One of the things you have to realize is software alone is not enough to actually make serious changes to technology, okay? You need assists. Sometimes they are like amazing assists like this one from SSD, okay? Fundamentally on the left side is your old database system, 
many of the new, new you know, the NoSQL systems, they do the same algorithms in terms of buffer management and so on. If any of you have looked at Mike Stromdick's paper on just throw out the old database stuff and then redo this, we actually did that. But we did that even further than what Mike had actually said. We said, we're going to bet on SSDs because we can actually just go directly to read from SSDs, and that's the key. Okay? And what is it? There are, it again comes with trade offs, as everything comes with trade offs. You need to have enough IOPS, so to speak, to read in parallel. So we just solve it with parallelism. SSDs with the, the Moosla effect are continuing to double and triple their IOPS like every two years now. And, and then their wear leveling is getting better. So the end result is we are able to completely get rid of all this middle stuff, uh, which essentially goes away. So you get something which is 100 times faster than the other things, okay? And then the rest of it, you know, whatever extra space we have, we, we, you know, it obviously gets slowed down to 80 times faster because we are now doing uh, migrations, you know, uh, we are making sure that things actually, uh, you know, are consistent. So that's what we use the extra thing. And then we still come like 80 times faster, and then, then you go, then you're in business, right? Now you can build applications uh, at 10 times or 20 times with smaller clusters, which actually are running, you know, uh, at 0.2 or 0.3 milliseconds response time as opposed to 0.2 with main memory. You know what? I think that's a pretty fair deal for one tenth the price, and that's kind of, you know, uh, what, what this shows, right? You can basically, uh, the interesting thing here, right, what this is showing is you can actually do higher scale problems. This is not a cost slide, okay? This is a scale slide. Because what it means is a, a small company um, can actually, doesn't have to spend like a million, you know, 2.5 million bucks, you know, for, for 250K, uh, you know, they can basically solve the same problem with less complexity. You know, if you see the number of servers here, it scares the heck out of me. You know, I, you know, I actually run services like you guys are doing. And the number of, more number of servers you have, if I can do one-tenth of servers, I reduce the power consumption, I reduce the complexity, I reduce my ops team kind of dealing after these failures. Because you know, you know how Google eventually reached scales where they just forgot to kind of fix the thing broken, they just leave it there. Because it's like, you know, you don't go fix them, you just can eventually replace the data center or the whole rack at some point when everything fails. So it, it, the, the scale there is, is so enormous. And then which means, and it now just becomes within reach of most people who want to do stuff like this. And going forward, right, I mean, I think Prakash talked about it. Any, any small company or large cap doesn't matter, they're going to have to deal with this world where uh, there is lots of data about users in the internet. And when somebody walks into your store, um, you don't know which of those millions of people walked in. But you really want to know exactly everything about that person for which you, you need to have that, you know, information. And then the, the main thing is it's all about an arms race kind of thing, right? One person figures it out, everybody goes to that store. This is the other thing about the internet. It's all or nothing, okay? If some site is, you know, 100 milliseconds, the other one is 80 milliseconds, it actually, everybody goes to the 80 milliseconds. It's not like, you know, it's actually a well understood and... Um, research kind of problem. It is almost that people always want to go to the place where they get the best service. And, and then once one person finds out, they blog about it, and the whole thing has, starts, and then the whole herd, so to speak, goes to the right place, and they all get the better service, and now the other guy better be better than that. So this, this, this whole thing is driven by this, this kind of, um, kind of uh, growth, you know. And this is just a slide telling you that SSDs are basically here to stay, and you know, original disk is it's over now. It's over. And we thought four years ago it was over, but it's now so over right now. And if you're not doing SSDs, you, know, you should be rethinking stuff. Um, the next uh, part of my talk is about, okay, so now that it talked a lot about very simple API. We started off in aerospace with very simple key value store APIs, where we were leveraging all of these um, uh, benefits of SSDs, of our clustering and so on to build you, you know, and, and many of our customers have used this. But then the first thing every customer who's deployed for a few years asks us about is how can I do more, 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 more in real time? I'm going to just spend like a few minutes on this. You know, I mean, skip fast, fast. So the kinds of things that we want to do is uh, how do we do secondary indexes? You know, how can I go uh, instead of building my own secondary index, which many of our customers did with our first version? Now we have you know next version of the product uh, where you know we can do it ourselves and we can do you know better jobs of you know and again we you know there are the, we, we follow pretty much all the principles I talked about all apply to secondary indexes too. Okay, the only thing is there are even more uh, interesting principles of secondary indexes. If the secondary indexes become really large, uh, we also need to kind of um, store them on SSD. Uh, those are the kinds of newer challenges that we have to deal with. And uh, for example, this just shows a simple scatter gather algorithm. So you build a secondary index for data along with the primary index on every node. Again, share nothing, you know, divide and conquer. I mean, these are like basic kind of principles we use over and over again. 
Um, so what you do is you go in, when you have a query to execute on the database, you just send the query to every node. Um, each node executes on the secondary index. It gets the, whatever the result it is in parallel, it processes it, and it sends it out to the client. Again, it's an intelligent client, so you don't actually bottleneck. We don't, we don't go send all the query to one node in the cluster which coordinates it. Believe me, we've, done, we've tried that in, in our previous version. It doesn't work. Because the hotspot rule is, is, is really brutal. It, 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 you just cannot violate it. Okay, and the same thing here. And then you can actually now go, go more than that. There's no need to just <coughs> you know, basically, the, what do you call it, retrieve the records in the secondary index. You could just run some more computation. You can do a group by, right? You can do, you can do arbitrary queries. You know, there's no reason why you can't do an arbitrary query on real-time read-write data. Just don't scan the entire database. That's kind of, kind of silly to do on a real-time database. I mean, you just slow everything down. It'll work, but you can only do one scan at a time. You know, you can still do real time. You can do backup on a database while while you're doing it. So you just have to control it. But 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 the point is, if you want to do things based on what's happening uh, within the last ten minutes, you know, I, th I think um, that's actually one of our customers actually deployed that. It's very simple. You just go in and run the same query every two minutes, saying, okay, tell me what changed in the last two minutes. That's that's an easy query to do because you have a range index on integer timestamps. It's a simple query. You know, not that much change. Let's say even if you're going at like um, um, you know, let's say, um, let's say 100,000 transactions a second. Um, it's usually not that many writes, that's usually weak. Let's say you go like uh, 2,000 transactions a second writes, right? In 10 seconds, you only have 20,000 records. You know, in two minutes, you only have a couple of hundred thousand. So you can comfortably do a range query on that and get like uh, 200,000 things. And you can get the answer within like sub second latency. You know, you can run this whole, you know, arbitrary kind of query like you know it could be anything right because this is all written in Lua in Aerospike so you know we don't we don't support SQL uh, but there's no reason why we couldn't in the future it just slows down at the user level but it's, it's there's nothing against SQL here SQL is just a query language which, which is slapped on top of this so but right now we use Lua and you can compute whatever uh, you want to compute based on the secondary index lookup looking at the data I mean, essentially, this slide is simply saying that row-based um, stuff works. I mean, there's, there's obviously a place for column-oriented work like Vertica and Cassandra and so on, but, but row-based gets you far, okay? So we can, and it allows you to kind of split up the database processing in such ways that you can do a pretty sophisticated things in real time. A little bit about lessons learned. Uh, performance, okay? It's, it's not about performance. You know, you can ignore the competitors in the slide. Uh, the thing which you should focus on is this. Aerospike can provide predictable performance at high throughput. Okay, that's what all of the stuff that I talked about here, this is lifted out of a third party, we did a benchmark on various databases. As, the, as you know, um, throughput increases, you really want to keep the latency low. And you can. That's kind of the interesting part. You can either say you can't and figure it out. And the reason the others can is not because um, they actually haven't built their own, you know, memory layer. They rely on the OS. Okay, again, this is a fundamental thing about databases. And this is this is again to some to a large extent, um, Aerospike is actually has very traditional views about databases. Okay, one of those traditional views about databases was operating systems do not actually do the right memory management schemes for data access. So databases have to build their own memory management schemes on DRAM, on disk, everything. So this is this is what Aerospike has simply. You know, taken the philosophy and the principles and applied it to SSDs and indexing and, and you know, tried to kind of get out of the way of all this multi-core guy, you know, processing going. That's why the divide and conquer helps. All of this is actually important to kind of leverage, right? So that's kind of why we are able to keep the latency low because nothing gets in the way of it. And, and you cannot let the OS get in the way of performance. If you do, then that's what you get in, in some of the other... Uptime, you know, I already talked about it. Aerospike always, I mean, whatever you're doing in the system, there is never any area of time uh, where you will have no service. Okay. That's just a no-no. We can't afford it. And many of our customers actually upgrade uh, during their peak time. In fact, we recommend that they size the capacity in such a way that they upgrade during the normal workday hours of their ops team. Because why, why, why have to like stay up at night to do upgrade? It makes no, no sense. I've actually done that myself. In the first days of Aerospec, and I go like, this is this is nuts. Nobody should be proving now. This is real work. Let's do it right. Let's size the system right. Let's make sure it works, and do it during the normal time. Observe all the things, and it works. And and, and so people don't actually think about it. And that's the other thing. 
you know, about our operation. And a little bit more about, you know, detail about the lessons. And I'll, I'll point out a few things here. Uh, I already talked a little bit about, you know, keeping the architecture simple. Hey, avoid manual operation. I mean, this is another thing. I mean, uh, we, this is you know, self-management stuff. When you add a new node, you shouldn't have to do anything to click a button to rebalance. I mean, of course you added a new node. You should be rebalancing. Just don't bring down the service. The only reason you have to have a button to click the rebalance is because you know the service is going to come down if it, you, you know, if you don't click it. So what kind of nonsense is that, right? So you don't want to do that. So, so those kinds of things we actually thought through like four years ago. This is not about other competitors and so on. We were like sitting, sitting there thinking about it and going like, we should make it easy to use. Um, keep the system asynchronous, okay? Share nothing, you know, make sure it's asynchronous across data centers, synchronous within data centers. You know, we, we just made all these choices, um, you know, which helps you to make sure everything is autonomous. You know, there, there was this uh, issue with Hurricane Sandy where one of the data centers got shut down for the customer, and then we just kept running because everything else was fine. And then they brought it back up. Thankfully, the data center didn't go underwater. Um, so they could turn it, off, turn it back on 12 hours later, and then everything just simply synced up. The logging and so on that we have. Uh, monitoring of the system extensively. This is actually extremely critical. Okay, you need to know we are running a service, and Aerospike provides um, support for it. You know, to monitor the 20, 30, 40, however how many things that you want, and then make sure there are only like three or four, which is really critical. We will tell you, you know, what it is. But you need to know when that happens. Most of the time, when you run out of space, people know like weeks before, months before. Nobody looked at anything, and then they go like, we're out of space. And they go like. What is the curve going like that? For, there was no alert set. Okay, nice. You know, and then we can still recover, of course. But the point is, now you're going to run around trying to find a machine. You know, the last minute trying to put it there and load it, and somebody make a mistake in the middle of the night. They didn't have the instructions. It was not automated. They're trying the instructions on the flight. So just just plan a little bit. You know, that that that's the other thing we've learned. So we kind of um, ourselves, of course. Frankly, we made mistakes. I mean, it's like four years of stuff. So we've learned from that, and these are kind of lessons from it. Um, size the clusters properly. Sizing is important. With, with something like Aerospike, with something like not Aerospike, in any product in the NoSQL space, I think every one of the customers, I mean, every one of you guys, you should demand that you know in half an hour or whatever, given your workload, what it takes to deploy the solution. You shouldn't have to write code, you should, have to, you should just take it. You know, that, what, that's kind of the first realization we had like three years ago with the first customer, who basically gave us a real tongue lashing because we couldn't give them something which, which, they could, which was actionable. So we spent like, you know, Brian and I, you know, my co-founder, we spent like half an hour because we knew how the stuff worked. We just wrote it up in a spreadsheet, and that spreadsheet still works. Because it, it, if the system is simple, you can capture it. If you can capture it, then you're gonna, you know, do stuff based on it. And then as, it, as the sizing improves, you know, so sizing is important. And upgrading SSDs and all that is pretty standard. Uh, you know, the, the geographic distributed data centers is pretty standard. And have a plan for unforeseen you know, situations, right? So again, as I said, device scenarios are practiced during normal work time. Uh, you know, if, if you want to take off, you know, we used to do that at Yahoo, and all big internet companies do this. I mean, and eBay, I'm sure, does it. You know, they don't wait until a disaster to throw the switch between one data center and another. Just throw it as a, you know, throw a data center down party or something and do it in the middle of the day. You know, uh, because uh, if it doesn't work then, it's not going to work when you do it under pressure. So you got to plan it. Uh, constantly test and monitor the app. It's important to monitor the end-to-end -end app because Aerospike, in many cases, can only do so much because it's sitting in the center. In every one of our deployments, we're sitting in the center of the whole thing. And, and anything goes wrong, they go like, oh my god, it's gone. It's gone. No, it's supposed to be Aerospike. But we are right there in the middle of it, right? And then we have developed tools and so on. So it's, it's useful to actually have an end-to-end -end view of your service all the time, even when things are going well. Because that might actually give you, you may actually want to look at stuff, even when things are, appear to be going well. Because when they go badly, is when those, that little glitch which happened in normal time, which nobody cared about, is the one that's going to go like that. You know? And then you go, like, everything is down because, you know, you, you know things like that. You, you can actually ward off a lot of it. And online and offline workloads, I think most of you know about that. And, you know, data management systems, and again, you know, there, there, are, there are cases, um, you know, I do have to say, you know, sadly, that Aerospike is not the right a tool for the job, but uh, you should look for it. Okay, I mean, if it's read-only data, if it's you know, if you don't really care about read-write, then there are many other systems that will do it better. But the read-only is not typically real time. So, so, so just make sure that you don't use the wrong tool for the job. And many people actually come to Aerospy from other databases because they, first of all, didn't know about us, but more importantly, they actually thought they could figure it out. 
um, using something else. And what happens is figuring it out actually, as I hope I have shown you, figuring it out, it, figuring it out is not impossible, but it's actually really hard to, to, to figure it out at scale. Uh, and that's our business. Uh, and there are others like us, but just make sure you look at the, these uh, products carefully uh, for your use cases and then you know, use the right one for yourself. Um, you know, this is just say a little bit about uh, what we have uh, in our product. You know, essentially, uh, we've added uh, since the simple key value stuff, we've added uh, some map reduce support, second index queries, user defined functions using Lua in addition to the platform that we have. So you can download all of this stuff from our. I'm going to skip past this one. Uh, you can get, you know, there, there's a free community edition uh, which you can download. There's, there's enterprise you can try also, the usual. So, <coughs> I think that's. Thank you. I can take questions as well. Or yes. Thank you. Thank you. My, my favorite slide was the one where you showed the cost was cut down in one tenth. <laughs> <laughs> just, just kidding. Of course, uh, coming from having worked for uh, Michael Stonebreaker company before, I know how acid uh, properties can be important. No other database in this space really seems to do this or do this well. So, uh, so that is really very important. I think you highlighted that. So thank you. Yes, let's do some uh, questions and answers, whatever questions you might have, and then we will get to the slide ten. Uh, the smart client and the data replication is the smart client responsible for the replication, or does it go through the uh, you know uh, node to uh, aerospike node to node? Well, the way the smart client uh, features work is. The, the map, so to speak, of where partitions are in the cluster is shared with the client. So if the replication factor is two, the map will have two entries. So the client will know uh, one of those two entries. Now, the client can make, let's say, let's say you want to do a read, and then the partition has two copies on the server. The client will know which, which of those two nodes have those two copies. It can make a decision of either going to one of those two randomly, or it can go to the master all the time for reads. For reads, I think going to either of them would work well, because it will still give you read commit behavior. It's just that even if a write is in progress, since we use record locking, uh, the client will get the slightly earlier version. The write could, you know. So it's possible that the write is completed by the time the, the, the client got the old value. But uh, that's just normal. But it's still got a valid value. So if you want to make sure that you serialize every read with every write, always go to, master, go to the master. But that information is available in the smart client. It can be configured. Did I answer your question? But does the smart client have to have to do things in the serial sense for the write? So the writes to the master and the writes to the replicate, or no. is the master write to the replicate? Master coordinates the transactions with all the replicates, not just one. It could be many. And it will do if there's only if there are two replicas, you, you still write to the master for writes. And then that that node will coordinate the transaction with all the replicas in parallel. And then return to the client after all of them are returned. And you can, of course, you know, as with every database, you can relax consistency levels. So you can do you know, delay you know, background right. But we don't recommend that. We're into consistency, so we want to make your application easier. I didn't understand fully, but is the topology of these distributed systems basically have a coordinator managing replication between all of these instances and checking for errors or downtime? Or is it more peer-to-peer -peer based? I didn't get that from Ours is completely peer-to-peer -peer based. There's only one type of cluster node. All of the functions which need to be required, including the coordination and application, are all in every node. And each node participates in different roles for these various uh, behaviors. It's completely <coughs> distributed peer-to-peer. Paxos-based synchronization. I didn't go into that. Is it even across data centers, or is it just interest in data centers is peer-to-peer? -peer? Only within the data center is peer-to-peer. Uh -huh. And then across data centers, it is cluster to cluster. That's a, at that level, it's peer to peer. So you could have a three node cluster or a five node cluster in one data center, and an equivalent eight node cluster in the other data center <coughs> linked. They are peers at the cluster level. Mm -hmm. um, but within each of those um, clusters, those eight nodes will be identical or homogeneous. And then within these, these five nodes, in the middle, it's new. So you need some kind of like, a, I get matching number of nodes configuration? Don't. There is no matching. Oh, okay. A cluster has capacity. Uh -huh. It is basically a number of nodes times whatever capacity each node has. 
And that capacity has to be the same as a cluster in a remote location if you want to make them peer to peer. That is, if all the data in one cluster has to be replicated in a remote cluster, the capacity of both clusters has to be the same. So the node count doesn't happen. Okay. In the, in the discussion, we, we use the words master. The one thing I would, I'm not clear about is this concept of transactions. And when we said, I have a key, a hash is computed, we identify a partition, we execute a transaction in that partition. But transactions may span multiple objects. So assume I have key A and B, and I say begin trans, insert value A, insert value B, commit trans. Now A and B might actually be on two different partitions on two different complete machines. Who is responsible for coordinating the transaction in a case where I have multiple values being updated or changed? Currently, Aerospike does not have support for multi-record transactions. We allow you to change a uh, single record with multiple replicas. So we keep that in sync across the cluster because that is uh, a hard problem, but not as hard as the multi record transaction. We can extend it, we haven't extended it yet. And because there are, you know, it's just one of those things we haven't done yet. But so that's what, what when I say transactions, I mean single record transactions with replication. Without replication, it's trivial. Right. I mean, it's nothing sort of known, and then you have to either write it to disk or not. We don't write to disk, as I said. We write to multiple copies in the cluster. It provides a certain level of um, reliability, which is sufficient for, you know, it's almost equivalent to putting it to this, this, this give you, well, How does this work then for alternate keys? So imagine for a single record, I have two indices for two, uh, primary. And the sec for the secondary index? Yeah. We handle that for secondary index. We actually. Um, uh, have an optimistic way of updating secondary index. We still kind of maintain the, um, what do you call it, um, read committed uh, behavior. Okay, there are some cases where we can relax repeatable reads, for example. You know, we can't do repeatable reads for a backup, it's very hard. You have to lock the entire thing, we don't do that. Uh, we, we generally do read committed for secondary indexes. So you can add a record, and then all the secondary indexes are, are, are a data record. You, you guarantee that the secondary index uh, values are accurate the moment after the write returns. So you, you will not return the old value. See what I mean? Right? You have a secondary index value changing on the record. I mean, there's an existing entry pointing to that record, and now a new entry coming to the record, those two will be atomic. Again, that actually is uh, well, localized important. to a node. It's important for that concept of immediate consistency, yes. right? The yes. two indices have to be one or the other. Yeah. So we extend it to secondary indexes, but we haven't extended it to multi-record. To some extent, this is a step on the way to that, but mm -hmm. multi-record is not something new. We do have what is called check and set, or read, modify, write kind of instructions, but that's a cop off. It, it, it basically making the application a little bit It will make your applications more complex. Like, that's against the philosophy, so we're not, I'm not going to recommend that you, you use that for multi-record. Which uh, NoSQL technology do you think is doing a good job as a uh, multi-insert uh, problem? Not, not, not any, but that's usually why they don't fall back to SQL or the classical relation to right. The reason I ask the question is, in banking, I want to do a debit transaction. I need to take money out of one account and put it somewhere yeah. else. I, I get it. Yeah, I, I totally understand that, and my only um, thing is we haven't just gotten around to it. We know how to do it. I mean, this is a pretty well understood technology from my old days at, at IBM. But but the issue is uh, it will slow down the system. Our actual um, focus has been in uh, building systems which uh, which are fast and which are scale. And then to add this other thing, it's slow. It may be okay. But, you know, if you can do both in the same database, uh, at some point I'm sure we will get to it more successful than growth, but it's not been a focus. I have, I have a question for Prakash. <laughs> uh, in, in your, in your uh, introduction or you know, your slide about the data, you mentioned that um, you can pull in data, say, a, a transaction that, was, that occurred two years back with such a large uh, you know, volume of data. Uh, how do you, you know, how do you how do you maintain that archived data, or, or what aspects of the data do you consider while uh, you know keeping up uh, accessible at any given point of time? Yeah, so that is some of the like we took keep data a lot of data in the real time system that we have. 
And that's when we look at which data should be in a real-time system in memory versus which should be on the disk. A lot of times when we look at like fast-moving segments, those are the data that we are keeping in our real-time system. Things that people, if a segment is considered of people who are searching for cameras, then I want to keep that in my real-time system. Purchase data, if it isn't large, then you can keep it. Purchase data is typically not that large as much as search and view data. So for different type of events, you create different type of windows. That this is what I want to keep in memory. This is what I want to keep on disk. And even the data which is on disk, you can utilize it to update your segments very regularly. And that is the kind of decisions you have to make because you're essentially going after where do I make the best thing for the buck. I mean, it would be great if I could keep everything in memory. Actually, I was like, we come close to that. I want to tell you that. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to add a little bit to that. Um, you can these days actually keep a lot of data in almost memory-like storage, which is SSD. And that's the new move uh, for all of these little SQL databases. So it, it comes in, you know, tens of gigabytes. It's just very easy. So when people talk about like running MapReduce on Hadoop, I mean, technology like this enables you to run MapReduce almost in memory. Things that don't become excessive in the US. So I had a question for our Can you throw some light on like how how the deletions are handled and how the cleanups are handled? Actually a great question. So our focus has been on data expiry rather than explicit deletions. Okay. So what we most of our customers use is a feature called time to live. So when a record is written, inserted or updated, you can set an expiry time for the record and then it automatically expires. Okay. You can also delete um, records, but we only delete from the index. We do not actually implement delete tombstones in the database. So there are, if, okay, it's good that our stuff virtually never goes down, because if you would actually start the survey every day, everything that deleted in the day could actually come back, because we only delete it in the index, which is in DRAM. Okay, this is actually an issue which uh, some customers have had, and we are actually working on solutions to that. Uh, it, is so, it is solvable. I mean, it just will, again, you know, that's a trade off, right? I mean, we decided to go on the expiry route, um, and then um, we find that some of our customers now require to do explicit delete, which means we might have to keep a side file with tombstones. But it's, it's an imperfect solution, but there's really no perfect solution for it. I mean, this is a classic old database problem. So we have this idea of phantom stuff showing up. Because you know, database can only do so much. Or it can be slow. We can actually obviously be slow and we can fill up the database with tombstones. Eventually, what will happen if you put tombstones is the entire database is full of tombstones. You have no space for anything else. And that, that's the trade off. How, how is the uh, memory reclaimed even if you delete from the index? But that's, oh. a uh, that's a great, great question, too. Because what we have, uh, I didn't spend too much time on, is uh, we implement a log structured file system on storage. I guess. So what that means is, it is a, it, it, every write is a copy on write, uh, has a copy on write semantics. So every time you write to Aerospike, a new copy is created. And the index points to it. Deletes is just a special case where you remove the index entry. So what that happens is it frees up these little um, uh, running tables we have about where data is on disk. And in the background, this is another thing about Aerospike, is everything, there's a lot of stuff happening in the background all the time. One of them is defragmentation of the disk. So we will go back and clean up the data. This is why I said if, if, if you, you can delete an index, it'll, it'll get cleaned up. Uh, but if you restart the node before it's cleaned up on disk, because it's happening in the background, then it could come back if it's not expired yet. If it's expired, it never comes back. Um, so that is, uh, so is that clear? Yeah. Do you support uh, any kind of locking on a yeah. value? We support record locking. How does it fit with the migration of the data? What happens to the locking scheme? Um, essentially, it's, again, it's, it's like a read coming in. So all these short transactions come in, lock, it's just, that's at a millisecond, it comes back. So migration simply wait until they get to the key, and, and that's okay. And again, it's, it takes time. I mean, migration happens in minutes. Uh, you know, it doesn't happen in, in seconds, right? It's, it's a lot of data. It's a partition is, you know, can have a lot of data. So it actually works quite fine. So applications like banking applications cannot use Aerospike, like banks. Uh, banking kind of critical applications can use Aerospike. Um, I 
when you say banking kind of applications, applications used by banks yeah. which are trying to move their uh, uh, current applications to be more internet scale mm -hmm. can use aerospace. If you're saying, are we going to replace your debit credit transaction or your current bank account? No. It's not even a goal for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, In fact, one of our advisors is Don Hadley, who actually is the father of DB2 at IBM. So uh, we kind of have a good idea of how that works. And I'm not sure we're going there. Okay. So, so what we are going to do is to enable new kinds of banking applications to be written, which are consumer friendly, so you can get your account data uh, correctly, accurately, with consistency, once you've done the debit and credit on the ATM. We're not going to go backhand the ATM, but you're going to be able to do everything else is going to come to us, or, or databases like us, because you're not going to put such high traffic applications directly against your mainframe or the backend that they use today. Uh, and they will just not work. And that's well understood. So, so, so we are there to enhance the banking applications, but we're not going to go replace uh, what's happening in the bank. That's not the goal.